Um, I'm going to do the thing I do at every presentation and forget my own name. <laughs> uh, so hi, everybody. I'm Piper. Uh, I am the author and co-maintainer of Pursued Pi Bear, which is what we're going to learn about today. Um, mostly uh, this, right now, I just kind of want to talk through the, um, the history and the concepts of the engine, um, which we will actually go into depth in a few minutes. But I'm going to give you some time. If you don't have a virtual environment with PPB installed, now is the time. If you don't know how to do that, please raise your hand now. OK. <laughs> I was building time for that into. So the big thing is uh, PPB is a slightly different game engine from everything else that's in the Pi game space. We are event driven, education focused. Um, and we, we stick to object orientation, where a lot of our libraries right now are data structures and flows. Um, that's pretty, pretty much all to say. Um, if you're interested in any of this information, pursuedpybear.org. Um, this has a link to our GitHub. It has a link to the page on PyPI and to the docs. Uh, you probably want to pull up the docs sometime before we get started so that you have them to reference. All right, so that's that. Um, so when we get started with this, um, I am going to, my goal here today is to get you through two different video games. Uh, they're going to be very small with very minimal features, but it should be enough to get you started and start designing new features to add to both of these. Um, mostly I wanted to give you some playgrounds. Um, most of what I'm going to be doing is here. Uh, back of the room, can you read what's up here? Okay. Uh, I would increase my font if otherwise. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, it, I mean, you're, you're welcome to look at my notes, but this is what I'm going to be leading you through. <laughs> Um, it will be up on screen pretty much the whole time, so if you feel I'm going too slow, you can move ahead and start trying to figure it out on your own. Um, but to start with, uh, if you've got your project set up, uh, just a folder with your virtual environment. Uh, in this case, I'm actually going to have a separate folder inside my project because I have some samples here. Um, I will give the link to these samples later in the day uh, so that you can go and double check your work and, you know, See it in order. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is we just need a file. Start with, you know, main.py. Um, for those who don't know, you can name this anything you want. We're just gonna use main because it's nice and simple. Uh, Alright, here we go. Um, so the nice thing is we actually, one of the things we've done in PPB is made it very easy to get your uh, GUI window up. Uh, so what we're going to do at first is just import PPB, and then PPB run. Uh, you can actually run the file at this point. If we do this, we should have a window. Um, so n now we have to actually do the hard stuff. Um, so the first thing we want to do is add what we call a sprite. Uh, in game parlance, uh, sprite does not necessarily mean an anim a uh, pixel animation. Um, it actually is what we tend to use the name in sprite, what we call a sprite-based engine uh, for the actual game objects. It's the things that move on screen. Um, they don't have to be animated, um, but this is the way we do it. This is an uh, object-oriented approach uh, to be compared to what is very popular in the game industry called ECS, which is Entity Component Systems. Uh, it's a nice thing to go research, but you don't really need to know it for what we're doing. Um, so let's do this. If we do a new class, let's just call it player, uh, this must Base sprite. So this is the basics you need to make a new uh, sprite for your game. Uh, this won't have any behaviors, but it will render when we do this. We will add a setup function. Uh, setup functions must take the scene as the first argument, and then we can scene.add a player. And then so 
Does everybody have a class with a pass and this function defined? If so, what we need to do is setup equals our setup function. You don't need to call it, the engine will do that for you later. Uh, and now you should be able to run this and you will have a colored square in the middle of your screen. Oh, let me move it out of the way. I'm sorry. <laughs> so we're going to do more interesting things with this square in a moment. Um, but in the meantime, this is functioning. <laughs> and get used to this loop of writing a little bit of code and running the program to see what happens. Uh, unfortunately, it's the best way to debug video games. <laughs> Is everybody ready? Like, are we here? Do you have a running square? What's up? I have seen that bug before. We're going to talk later. Um, but it should be fine. Um, we will come check that out. Um, I actually want to go look, but we probably shouldn't. Uh, tell me if that's still happening after the next couple of steps. All right. Anybody else? All right, next step. Uh, we've added our setup function. Uh, all right, so let's actually make it so that uh, the player can move. So what we're going to do is set some cap class attributes. Uh, velocity is going to be ppb.vector. Um, this can be pretty much anything, but if you want to start with 0, 4, Double check what I'm doing here. Speed and position. All right. Uh, I need to stop deleting my own code. Um, all right, so we've got our velocity. Uh, we also want a speed value. All right, that's, that's what I've got to change. So we do this, and we do a speed value, which is also going to be a vector. Or no, it's going to be a number. I've messed this up multiple times. Um, uh, and then we can also do position. All right. So this is just set up for later. This is actually only going to change one thing about our game. Uh, your sprite is going to be a diff in a different position on screen. Um, you can play with these values and see what it actually does. You can move around, like change the two parameters to the position vector to experiment. Uh, but if we run this one, we have now put our object at the bottom of the screen. Uh, by default, the camera in PPV is centered on the origin, so zero, zero. Uh, so when we did zero, negative four, we just moved down. Uh, we, if we did 0, 4, it would go up. Um, basically, it's standard coordinate plane under the hood, but the camera can be moved, which we're not going to do in this sample, but it is a thing you can do. Um, so let's add... I'm going to do this a little out of order. Uh, we are going to do... So this is what we call a handler function. Uh, every event handler that we write in PPB is going to look like this. Uh, it is on the name of the event in snake case. Uh, so in this case, update is underscore update with a lowercase u. Um, and it also, it will take the event as the first parameter that is not self, uh, and the, a signal function, which is actually how you put new events into the system. We will do that later, and you will get to see how that works in action. Um, so this is it. Uh, now what we're going to do is self.position plus equals self.velocity times speed self.speed. And then we actually want to do this based on time. So we are going to take the event and time delta. All 
All right, so this is a very simple thing. We're going to add some more code to this later, but this is going to let you see how an event handler works uh, before we start doing all the fun stuff. Uh, so if we run this file, your sprite should move off the screen. Do you actually have things rendering in the back? No? Yes. Let me come and look at that. So everything that's going, start, mine starting at the top and going down. And I'm using that. Right, unless I'm not seeing something clearly. Can't freeze that one. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, here's the bad. All right, let's see. What do you want to do? Freeze it? Yeah, just find out which PPB it's running. Is this an older? This is what the second of your Oh, okay, okay, okay. That's what you see. Yeah. Okay, so there's a weird quirk with PPB that, or with Pygame that uh, occasionally this happens if you install it in a virtual environment. Um, are you comfortable installing it globally? And yeah, okay. So try that and see if that helps. Yes. You so some quirks in the SEL library. Uh, on Mac. So you said something about virtual environments? Uh, on a Mac, sometimes it. Well, no, the the reverse is an older uh, PPB. Is it 0 0.6? 0 0.1. Oh yeah. So update that to 0 0.6. Okay. So install. I will explain that one in a moment. Exactly right. Um, you got the right version of the title. I'm sorry, I'm not sure. Yeah, so we like to follow along with okay. up there, and I'll, I'll keep going. Okay, okay. Yeah. wonderful. Okay. So, I am going to cover the topic of why your sprite was going downward. Um, so, it used to be that PPB actually used a rendering context for its uh, Cartesian coordinates. Uh, in most graphical contexts, positive Y is down. Um, so from 0 0.5 to 0 0.6, we flipped the Y axis so that it matches what you're used to in math and less what I'm used to for graphics. Um, so that's the change uh, and why you needed an update. Um, otherwise, it was doing exactly what I told it to do. <laughs> Um, all right, so uh, event handlers, class, this is great. Uh, it's not really a video game if you can't interact with it, so let's start adding that. So that's just another event type, def on key pressed. Event is events dot key pressed. And signal. So at this point, you should start seeing the pattern for our event handlers. As I explained, it's just the name of the event in a uh, snake case uh, with an on in front of it. Um, so when we do this, we actually need to define a couple of controls. Um, I like putting them in a dictionary. So at the class level, we just do a controllers object. And then we're going to name one left. Now just put none uh, and right. All right. Let's do another import from from PPP. Import key codes, and I like renaming this as keys, uh, but you don't have to do that. Uh, and then what you will find when you do this import is keys has a whole list of all of the keys on the standard American keyboard. Um, so go through this, pick whatever your favorite uh, control scheme would be. Uh, 
left and right are actually the words left and right. Uh, those will be your arrow keys. Uh, for those of you who are more used to modern video games, uh, A is just a capital A, keys dot A, and D is capital D. So yes, feel free to go through this. Um, if your IDE does not show you these things, uh, you can go to the documentation, and in the API reference, there's the events, or excuse me, where are the keys? I could have sworn we had the keys on here. It does not, I don't see them though. Um, so that. So alternatively, go through our website to get to the GitHub. Uh, so this is the actual repository. Uh, if you go into PPD and into P-Codes, uh, here's the list of all of the various classes so you can look up your favorites. And clearly I need to put an issue in to fix that tonight. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to do keys.a, keys.t. And then on key pressed, we want to do self dot velocity equals. Oh wait. If event dot key do uh, is self dot controllers. Oh, you can also rename controllers to controls. I'm going to leave it as it is for now. Um, we just want to know which one we're doing. And then we do self.velocity plus equals. Get used to working with vectors. We're going to do a lot of it. Uh, so left on the current fusion plane is negative. Uh, x is your first value, y is your second. So we are doing vector minus 1, 0. And then similarly, do an L elif. Event.key is self.controllers right. Uh, I can tell you to run this right now, and you'll get some behavior you might not expect uh, in that we still have our default velocity going up. So here, let me just demonstrate it. And so it's going to keep going up. So what I you should probably do uh, is convert your velocity vector to default to zero. And then if you run it, if I hit A, if I hit D, I hit D again. So basic keyboard controls. We're going to make this nicer. Don't worry. Uh, so the next step is we want the, the inverted control. When you release a key, we want to reverse both of those vectors. Um, there are better ways to do this. Um, um, instead of doing this as a big health street like this, there's ways to do this as a diction in the dictionary. Um, don't worry about that. Um, you, you can do that separately, but this will be basically a copy. Except we want to invert both of our vectors from before. of what's happening here. Yes, no, no, okay. Um, so yeah, in general what we need to do 
uh, move in the direction we want to go when we press the button, stop going that direction when we let go of the button. Uh, I will leave all of this available for you to look at. How far behind is everybody? Oh, just quick question. Why does inverting the number, why is inverting the number stop? Is, I mean, in my mind, I would think just like, don't do anything or like a stop. Uh, so that's basically what's happening. Um, but uh, when you add an up and a down control to this, uh, if what you do is on key release set to zero, if there was directions going the other way, so the y axis was being changed, when you let go of the horizontal button, it still zeroes out. So you lose that control. Gotcha. Um, so the reason we have to invert it is actually so that we can continue doing all the other directions that we might have controls on. Um, so that's the reason. Um, <laughs> all right, is everybody up to this point? All right, so at this point you can run it and you should be able to go left and right just as much as you want and it stops when you let go. If you hit both keys, it doesn't do anything. <laughs> did you move, did you change, okay, initial, okay, so initially you reset the velocity zero, that's what I missed. Oh, yeah. Up the top. <laughs> Sorry, up the top. I didn't want yeah, to about that. That's all right, I'm, I'm trying to, my typing's not as fast. So no, that's fine. Here. This is why I check in quite often. <laughs> all right, so. So as long as we're good here, so this is controls. You now have a player spray. Um, we've done all of that, inver on that. Um, we've already done our update thing. Uh, so the reason we use on update is actually there's a game programming pattern called the update pattern, which is every game tick, you update everything in the simulation. Um, often uh, in Pygame, it's actually just called update is the method that you put on your sprites. I uh, care we it's an event that's fired. So it's uh, mostly we do a thing in PPP called fixed step simulation. Uh, so we run the renderer more or less at 30 frames a second, but we actually let the simulation happen at 60 frames a second. Um, so it's two separate events that fire those two things. So you can't really do them all at once. Um, so that's why that all is. Um, so the next step, we are actually going to give our player a projectile. We're going to be able to shoot something. Uh, normally, we would actually put some sort of image to this. Um, but for right now, let's just get through this, and then I can talk through images for you uh, and give you a little bit of space to program on your own. Um, so first things we want to do is my mouse. Uh, so we need a new class. It's going to be called projectile. It's also a sprite, so we need to In this case, so you, you should see the pattern we're getting into here. This is going to be the exact movement uh, system that we use for players, uh, except we don't need controls on projectiles. They just go in one direction when we let go. Um, so we can just set our velocity and speed and then let it go. Um, I actually set this up in this way where the speed and the uh, direction vector are separate things, uh, mostly so that I can modify them separately. Um, so if I decide that, hey, bullets move too fast, I can change just the speed and everything else does exactly what I expect it to do. Uh, so that gives you an idea of what that's all about. Uh, unit vectors are fun. <laughs> and then we don't actually need to put a position on this one. Uh, because we will actually deal with that in a moment. But let's also do the on update. So we clearly haven't put this into the scene. What I'm going to have us do is actually just create one at startup time. 
So we'll fire one bullet just for free um, so we can see that our code is working. So what we do is we come into the scene setup again, and we're going to scene.add projectile, and we're going to go position equals I don't want it to go through our players, right? So I'm going to just move it over to the side. It doesn't matter where you do this. It's not going to interact with anything. It's just going to let us see it. Uh, uh, so what we're doing here is actually taking a advantage of the PVB sprites init function. Um, PVB uh, expects our, our sprites to be um, basically data backs. They hold a bunch of data. Um, and so I'll, we will just, if you give us a keyword argument as part of the init, we will set that on the uh, sprite for you. So you can do all of this with base sprites and just passing it in. It's just kind of hard to reason about when you do it that way. Um, but it lets us do things like this, where we can just go, hey, move this thing when I instantiate it instead of using the default. Uh, so that's what's going on here. Does everyone have their projectile class and setup in your setup function? All right. So. You can run it locally, but I will now run my version. Hmm, it is not moving. I did something wrong. There we go. Uh, if you did equals and not plus equals, that's going to not work. <laughs> and now we have our little laser beam. Uh, it's actually not a little laser beam. Uh, it's quite big. So what we should do, oh. let's add a new thing here. Let's make it a quarter size. So we do that, and we have a much smaller bullet now. <laughs> All right, so we have bullets. Next thing we want to do is we want to be able to do this as a controlled thing. So the ship is going to fire projectiles. Well, I say ship. Ship is what the original of this was. The player is going to shoot projectiles. All right. So to do this, we're going to need a new control. So we're going to have a control. We're going to call it shoot. Or actually, project is better. And I like using space. Again, you can go through the key codes. You can find your favorites. You know, this is not a fixed thing. This is just we have control. All right. So that's going to be an on press. So we're just going to do this. Uh, so in this case, we don't actually hold, have all the things we need to make this happen. So what we want to do now is So for now, we're just going to print. All right, so now we have the control wired up. Uh, so now if you test it, you can run it. And in your terminal, oh, this is why I don't read any things. <laughs> So now, when I hit the space bar, we get projected in our terminal. All right, so we know that's wired up correctly. Uh, in general, I consider it kind of a bad pattern to create other objects on game objects. Uh, you should let something else in your game do that. Uh, so we're going to do it with, in this case, we're going to use the what we call a scene uh, and give it its own event handler. Uh, but we're going to do this in three steps. First, we're going to make a new event type. Uh, so to make our new event type, we need to actually import data classes. You can import the whole module if you want, but we really only just need the data class decorator.
Um, so for those of you who have not used get classes yet, uh, basically this allows us to define things as class attributes, and then we'll create the whole class and all of the comparison methods and things that we need. They're really cool. Um, they also use type hinting, which is quite useful. Um, in this case, we just need the position, and it needs to be a vector. All right, so we, we've written our data class. Ni nice and simple, right? So now we can replace our print function with signal project. And then we actually need to give self.top.center. Uh, there's a whole collection of these accessors on all of our sprites, so we can get the top, the left, the right, the bottom, uh, and all of the corners and the centers. Um, and it all looks like this, and it works about how you expect from seeing that pattern. Uh, so if you do dot left dot top, you're going to get the top top left corner. Uh, similarly, you can do dot top dot left and get the same result. Um, but we have a bunch of this, so now we can fire from the middle center of our uh, player uh, to make it shoot from the middle, which is what we're doing here. Um, unfortunately, at this point, uh, it doesn't do anything because it's firing a new event that nothing's listening for. So, one more class. We're going to call it a game. This one is a scene. Uh, the short version of what scenes are, scenes are parts of games. Uh, under the hood, PPB has been making a scene for us. Now we're going to tell it what scene to actually create instead of using a default one. Um, in this one, we actually don't really need anything here except for on project. <laughs> All right, so nice one line function. Uh, we can delete our test projectile now. And then in our run function, we need to tell it to use our game as our starting scene instead of the default. Everybody to this point? Do I need to scroll back and show anyone any other code? What's that? Uh, could you go back to the, uh, the DAC last degree? Yep, there you go. And then when you get a chance to, you can go back down. Yep. To Are you done with the data class? Yep. All right, here we go. Yeah, sorry. It, I find it best to define all of your events at the top and your scenes at the bottom, um, mostly because it makes it much clearer of where everything exists. <laughs> you, you could have like interleaved these wherever you wanted, but again, I'm just this is the layout that works for my brain. So it's a quick question, just design-wise. So yep. The starting scene is kind of like your your state, your background, and then the setup are the things that should exist at the beginning of your game in this case. Correct. Okay. Um, and you actually don't need to use the setup function. If you want to define your own init and call super, um, that will work. And then you can just do all your setup in your init, which makes sense for some people. But this is, this is the flow from if you're not using a scene and then creating a scene with handlers, you don't have to immediately pull that into a knit. You can wait until it's more complicated. Um, so that's basically what's going on there. Is, uh, you could absolutely condense all of this into a single class. We're just not doing it here. We'll do it later. <laughs> um, OK, so uh, if everybody is ready, here we go. We can actually run this. We move left and right. And if we hit the space bar, we can put all kinds of bullets. Um, I will warn you, if you sit here and do this long enough and continue shooting bullets, uh, the game will slow down intensely because we're not doing something we need to do. Uh, the challenge for you is when the bullets end up off screen, you probably want to remove them from the game. Uh, we will show you how to remove things. You'll just need to do the fi figure out how to do the bullets part. Um, so that's just a warning of performance in games. You don't want objects that stop mattering sticking around, so you want to get rid of them. Um, but we'll get there in a moment. 
All right, so we've done our shoot event. Uh, we signal it, it's working, that's great. Okay, uh, so the next step, if we're shooting something, we should probably hit something. Uh, so we're gonna add targets. So. Again, gonna keep it, because these are also going to be sprites. Uh, So these don't need a velocity, they don't need a speed, they don't need a size, uh, and because we're probably going to set the position as part of our setup function, we don't need to add that. So right now they can literally just be that. Um, so once you've written your, this uh, basically empty class, um, we're gonna come down here, and we are going to do a four x in range. All right, let me think about this process because I will do it wrong if I don't. Uh, so what we want to do is we're going to just make five of them. And we probably want them on the zero point, and then two units out, and then two units out. And so when we do this in a range, it will be minus four to five with a step of two. Advanced range. If anyone's not done this yet, this is uh, starts stop and step value. Very cool. Uh, it will do exactly what we need it to do. And so what we're going to do is scene.add. Uh, we need a target. Position equals the vector x and then our y. So our shift at the bottom, we're probably going to put the targets at the top of the screen. Uh, so if it's negative 4, top of the screen is probably positive 4. Uh, there we go. So I will leave this up for a second. I'm going to start the game and move it out of the way, though. All right. So there we go. We've got five targets on screen now. That's all that took. Um, but unfortunately, uh, hitting them doesn't do anything. <laughs> uh, so we're going to do that part, and that's collision detection. Uh, we're only going to do circle collision detection because it's very easy to do and easy to reason about. Um, there, are, there is so much research on how to do collision detection in simulations. Um, it is a wonderful rabbit hole if you ever want to go research that. I enjoy some of this stuff. But circle collision is nice and easy and we have all of the IDA. We have everything on every one of our sprites to do a simple circle collision. So let's do that. We're actually going to do this in the projectiles on update, um, mostly because there's going to be a lot more projectiles than targets, and I would rather uh, we do the smaller loop each step. <laughs> um, so that's why we're putting it there. This could just as easily go on the target, uh, and then just invert the, uh, the various uh, relationships. Uh, so what we need to do is a for loop. So for target in event.scene. Uh, so every single event in PPP, even our project event, uh, the engine adds the current scene to that event. So you can always access the current state. We're going to do a get, and the kind is target. So the get function, scenes for the most part are just simple containers. Well, simple is putting it mildly. Um, they're, they're, getting more complex, but for the most part, what they're there to do is hold a bunch of sprites so that they can interact with the engine. Um, so when we do dot get, there are two ways we can do this. We can do it by kind. Uh, kind we use kind to mean type, uh, which is why I can just pass the type target to it. Um, but there's another option called a tag. Um, when you do scene.add, you can actually tag the objects uh, with arbitrary tags. Uh, just to demonstrate this. Uh, if we come down here, you don't have to do this in the, your game because it's not actually going to change anything, but just to show that this is a thing you can do. Um, like We know it's a player, but I'm going to tag it with player and mobile, uh, since it's one of the only things on the in the game that is mobile. Uh, 
And so these tags will be there, and then you can search by tag as well. Uh, you can also use both keyword arguments together to get things of that kind with that tag. Um, that's for more advanced games with a lot more objects. Um, like as you start building up more enemies, you might want to tag them with boss. So we come back up here to our four target in, and what we want to do is, this is going to look gnarly, I'm going to warn you. Uh, so if self.position minus target.position, dot length is less than self dot size plus target dot size. This needs to be in friends. Divided by two. Uh, so this is our hit condition. If the distance between two objects is less than half of their size, half of each of their objects sizes combined, they're close enough to be touching. Um, and this is trivial to prove if I had like a graph up here that I could draw it for you. Um, uh, but this is the definition of collision for surface. Uh, we are just using the size as the radius, which is not fully accurate, but it's close enough for what we're doing. Um, and then we're using uh, the dot length method on vectors to figure out, hey, what's the distance between these two things? Um, and vector subtraction is what is giving us the vector, the the actual vector between those two points. Uh, so that's why it looks as gnarly as it does, but it will absolutely do what it's supposed to do. So, uh, is, position, is position based on the center of objects? Like yes. Okay. Um, that is a an opinion we encoded. Um, we might add an anchor one point. Uh, probably not, though, because it is much easier to reason from the center of an object than it is to uh, do anything else. <laughs> Um, all right, and so when we do this, we now do event.scene.remove self. Uh, bullet hit something, it probably shouldn't keep flying. Um, and then, this is bad habit, but I'm going to show it to you anyway. <laughs> uh, generally, uh, when I'm doing a game like this, uh, I would actually rather have like a method on our targets that takes, hey, I did this much damage to you, and then it can figure out when it needs to die. Um, we're not doing that here because we don't actually, we aren't designing any of those systems. Um, so we can just remove the target ourselves in the bullet. Again, bad habit, you probably shouldn't do this um, because this is when it gets hard to reason about like what's happening to an object at any point. Um, but for our purposes, nice and simple. All right, so. Who needs what part of the code shown again? Anybody? No? All right, so now. Uh, must have. Oh. Well, you did the tagging. I might have missed something in my tagging. Again, you actually can remove the tags if you want. They, yeah, we're it's not like doing anything there, like but I don't know. It's going to be um, an unexpected error. I think it's parentheses issue somewhere. Uh oh. I'm just gonna get rid of them. I'm just gonna get rid of the tag. It was working without the tag. Go over there just in case. Alright, so I'm going to run my sample for a second. Oh. Oh. It's not tag, it's tags. Tag. <laughs> so it's the tag is the is the error I got is the expected error. Yep, that was me. Yeah, I, I expected messed it up. Error. I like the expected error. These are the reasons they tell you not to live code. <laughs> uh, yeah. There we go. All right, so now if we start this, we can move left and right, and we can do some shooting. Hey, look at that. Um, all of our targets are on. Um, so this is game one. We, we have a functioning game. Um, so I'm going to give, let's see, where are we? We've got about an hour. So I'm going to give about 15 minutes for you to explore this one and experiment with modifying it. Um, during that time, I'm going to show you a website that I use to create pixel art, uh, so I can demonstrate actually putting images on your uh, objects. Um, and then after that, we're going to get into another uh, program. So, so I'm going to put this down for a second, since unless anybody is not at a functioning version 
except for a person in the back who is not rendering for whatever reason. <laughs> I am so sorry, I wish I could fix that. Um, so, nobody? Okay, cool. So, my favorite pixel art program is actually a web app. So you can use it anywhere. Uh, this is my profile on here. Uh, so Piscal uh, is piscalapp.com, uh, P-I-S-K-E-L-A-P-P.com. You can sign in with get, uh, Google account if you've got it. Um, this, is, this does a couple of really neat things that actually work really well with PPP. Uh, primarily, all of the sprites that Piscal does are squares. Uh, PVB expects your sprites to be squares, so if you draw them in this app, you're going to get the right thing out. Um, so this is a, some interesting stuff that I've done over the years. Um, let me actually sign in. As I said, it, it is a Google account. Uh, that's all you need to sign in. Um, we are actually going to use these in a few minutes, but in the meantime, uh, for the game we just built, I want this one. So. When you come in here and edit your sprite, it has a wonderful export system that if you export as a zip, right here. Uh, so what we can do from this point, all you need is an image property, and this will be so this is actually one of my sprites for another game I'm building, which is why there's a bunch of these with uh, various bits, uh, but all we have to do is that, we hit run, and now there is a image sprite there. Um, the other thing you can do is in the case of this example, if we copy this, and we're going to call this player.png. And then we can delete our image file. And we still have it. So if you name it after the class.png, uh, it will pick it up for you. Uh, if you want more control over that, you can give it that image attribute. Um, I am not actually going to show you how to do this throughout the rest of this. Um, but I did want to give you the opportunity to see this is how you add images to your game. Yep. So when you attach an image to the player class, so to speak, does it resize the image to whatever the base sprite is, or how does it? Yep, it, it resizes it so that the, see if I can remember this algorithm since I wrote it so long ago. Um, it resizes it so that the shortest um, side of your sprite matches the size of the object in the game. Uh, so if you have like a sprite that's a little bit wider than a square, uh, it will be one, the one unit or whatever its size is tall, and then it'll go out a little bit on each end. Uh, mostly that doesn't actually matter because uh, in a lot of games the collision hitbox is actually smaller than the sprite. Um, so it actually kind of does exactly what you need it to do. Um, but that is a thing to be aware of. If you do just squares though, it, the bounding box of the sprite is the bounding box of the image and it'll work like that. All right. So is there anyone who has a question on things that we could do to this? Um, features that you are interested in that you're not sure you can make, uh, go for it. Um, so you said, so if I were to give a position of, let's say, the player is 0, 0, it yep. would be working in the center. Yep. So the logic would be, if I were to detect when the bullets go off screen, it would be divided by? Uh, so. How, 
So the trick for that. Um, I didn't know if there's a built-in method. Or no, they, there is actually not a way to determine collision with the camera right now. Gotcha. Okay. Um, we are working on it. Um, one day that will be a possibility because it is such a, a normal thing to just call things when they get off screen. So it would have to hard code the values for Right. You would have to know what the top is. That's um, in this case where we're not moving the camera around, that's a fixed value. So it's very findable. Um, in fact, the, uh, the Y position to look for is 6. Uh, because that is far enough off screen that it won't actually cause any problems. Uh, but again, I'm not going to show you how to program that, but I will walk through that. Any other questions? How would you go about like changing state? So for example, Mario eats a mushroom and now his sprite is different. Um, you literally just change that image line. So if- it, So like on some event, like there'd be some method that would be like on some event self dot image just changed. Yep. Okay. Um, I actually, uh, the game that these sprites that I'm showing off came from, uh, there's a power-up system, and when you pick up a power-up, uh, it throw, it actually calls a method on the uh, player because it just went, hey, am I colliding with the player? Uh, that method goes, hey, here's what my like power-up state is, and then the ship knows how to power, like change its image and any other bits of itself to be able to do that. Uh, you can also make a property that does it dynamically, uh, which is another trick that I like, but uh, don't really show off because it's kind of complex. <laughs> all right, any questions from the other side of the room? Anything at all? Okay. Um, but yeah, so I love Pistol because again, you can download it out of that zip file and you get every image you need and then you can just use that. Um, so we're going to move on to game two. So this is, uh, when I give you the repository, targets is the game we just went through. Virtual pet is the one we're about to do. Um, and I will try to give you enough time that if you want to make uh, sprites for this, don't spend more than a minute or two because you're just doing dev art. Um, but you can make an image and download it very quickly uh, and I will try to give you time to do that as we go through this, because there's, this one has a lot more moving pieces than we just did. Um, some of the steps, well, as you can see, there's 11 steps, steps that we're gonna go through, versus the, uh, I think, nine? There, oh, there are 11 for this one. Uh, the steps are bigger, I know that for a fact. <laughs> um, so I need this code outline. this. All right, so now we are about to do some complicated stuff. So here's our live sample in game two. Uh, what I want you to do is create a Python package. Uh, we can call this virtual pet. Uh, if you don't have a tool that cre adds uh, a Python package like this, uh, it's create a folder, name it, and put an empty init.py inside of it. Uh, so this is our init not pi, it is completely empty. Uh, so this step should take only about 30 seconds. Um, uh, the next thing we're going to do is where this gets fun. We are gonna do setup.py. And let's see if I can remember how to do this from memory. <laughs> Actually, I'm not going to do that. I'm just gonna go steal mine. Um, so here is, here, here's actually what we're going to do. Uh, so we need to, from setup tools, import setup. Uh, we call our setup function. Uh, name is the name of that folder that we just created. Uh, version 0 0.1 is fine. You can also do 0, 0. Um, it's unfortunately required. <laughs> um, packages is going to be a list with just the word virtu the virtual pet name space. Um, install requires PPV, so that just makes sure that if PPV isn't installed when we install it, it will install itself. Um, and then put your name in the author. This is about as simple as setup.py files will ever, ever get. Um, and we're mostly doing this uh, because we get some cool benefits from using this. Uh, instead of doing, well, I'll show you in a few moments. <laughs> I should not leave myself as much as I do. All right. All right, is everybody done with this or are you still working? Yep, okay. 
<laughs> I, I absolutely do want do not want to move from this step until everybody has this on the page because these are not fun. Um, I actually generally generate these with a tool. Um, so. For those of you who have never packaged anything, welcome to the wonderful world of packaging. <laughs> also, if you named your folder anything that is not virtual pet. Uh, you are going to change the name of the package and the name of the packages uh, to match whatever that folder is called. So just out of curiosity, who here has actually packaged something before? Is this your first is this everybody's first time? Nope. Okay. Awesome. I'm happy to introduce you to this because it actually does give us some wonderful stuff. Uh, I think I see one person typing stuff too. Well, people are typing. Turns out Pygame is not compatible with Mac OS Mojave, and there's weird hacks to try to make it work. So uh, next time I'll do. Something yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't but... know about that yet. Otherwise, I would have warned. <laughs> it's specifically it's been fixed um, in a lot of. There's a lot of versions of Python where it's fixed, but if you're using Brew. To install, which I am for everything. Got and it. Okay, yeah, I, I do uh, python.org installs for everything. So, okay, thank you for that knowledge. I will have to note that somewhere. Um, and we should probably help somebody fix it. Ah, uh, all right, cool. So, Mojave does not work with PPP. Good to know for the future. Um, but it is, I'm running Mojave. Oh, is it working? But I do everything through Mojave. Oh, you do it through Ponda. Okay, yeah, I've got a full account. Homebrew. And Mojave. So anyone who's watching this on film, Mojave and Homebrew do not work together with EPB. Good to know. All right. All right. Is everybody done with their setup.py? We are only going to modify this one more time after this. So just be glad that like we are near the end of having to deal with this thing. Um, so the next actual step that we're going to do is we need to do pip install. Right. Make sure that you're actually in the whatever folder you're building this package in. Uh, we are in game two. Uh, if you don't have yours laid out this way, just make sure you're in that place. Uh, it, the command you need is pip install dash e dot. Um, so dash e is development mode for Python packages. Uh, this means that we can actually modify it and will, when we run the, our Python commands, it will actually be able to find this. Um, so this is basically going to give us another way to run our game that is a little nicer, in my opinion. All right. So if you do that, it's going to do the thing. Uh, why did you do that? I got a failure. Yeah, game two is where I should be. Okay. It does not like that. So you're not in the virtual pet folder, you're in game. Yep. So virtual pet should be closed folder. I am so glad that this is how things go. <laughs> For what it's worth, I'm in the same direction right now. Yeah, no, it, yeah. this works consistently most of the time. Uh, this is actually the first time I've had it fail, and I tested this like four times before I entered this room. <laughs> so, um, this is not a big deal for me. So, I'm actually going to move it out of this. I'll move it back before I commit this stuff for all of you to find later. Um, is the, the setup.py not in the virtual pet, it's in the main one or game Yes, it, it lives next to the package, not under it. That's the issue. Okay.
I'm going to do this the hard way. If you do it and it works, uh, if it didn't work, let me know. We will come debug your system. I can work around this. <laughs> so, everybody good? No, I'm so Okay. You should end it with a virtual pet egg. Yes. Yep. All of that should happen. Um, it goes through that process and then airs out because you can find the uh, package directory for virtual pet. Uh, Change this so that you can. Let's just call it, right? Yeah. Okay. As long as you make sure to have that init file in there, should be good. Alright. So, what I'm going to do is just crash this whole thing. See if this works. Otherwise, again, I will continue. Um, this does not change what I'm going to demo. It's just going to get harder. in the one it needs to be in, but what I'm going to do is switch over to the one that I know runs. <laughs> right, so, we're going to just... so this is actually the file that I did all of the development on this on. Um, so this virtual pet is just the sample. Um, I will Now it's installed. <laughs> All right, so we are just making it work. So we have our init, we had our setup.py. Um, so the very next thing we want to do is we actually want to add a new Python file. This is called mini. Two underscores main two underscores dot py. Right. Uh, so what that actually is going to let us do is we can now actually run our game with the Python dash m flag. Uh, so if we do import ppb, ppb.run. So this is the same startup we had before. Uh, it's got a lot more files, but that's because we're going to do a lot more work. Uh, and so if we run, if we do, again, python-m virtual pet, hey look, we have a window. Uh, but instead of having to call the python and passing the script, 
we are actually invoking a module, a uh, very cool pattern uh, which works really good when you're building applications. Uh, we're actually going to do our next thing. Uh, I'm not going to because it's here for us. <laughs> um, all right, and so this is the next change we want to make. Uh, everyone got their main file done, yes? Yes? Okay. Uh, so in our setup.py, we are now going to add what's called an entry point. Uh, so entry points equals a dictionary with console scripts, console underscore scripts, as a key. And in that list, we need virtual pet equals virtual pet, pet virtual underscore pet dot dunder main colon main. Uh, this is awful looking. Um, pretty much all console script entry points kind of look like this. Um, uh, the basic layout of this is that the Virtual, before the equals in that string is what the command is actually going to be on the command line. Uh, after that, it's the package, the module, and then the, uh, the colon tells you which function to call. Uh, and so we're going to have to go back into main and add a main function to make this function. That works going to be long meaning by the end of the day. <laughs> run it, and then as soon as you stop it, as you see down here at the bottom, we're going to end up with an import error because main is not defined. Uh, is everyone done with their modifications to setup.py? Is anybody still working? Okay. So I'm going to come off the screen. If things don't work, we can come back to this in a moment. So back in your main, what we're actually going to do, uh, we're going to keep the import PPP. We're going to do a def main, no arguments, pdb.run, and then down here, if name equals main. Okay. Uh, and we do this, and now both our entry point is going to work and our Python m is going to work. Uh, and just to demo real quick. <coughs> so virtual pet, we run it, we close it, we don't get an error. Uh, but then if we do Python dash M virtual pet. Okay, so there, now we have a whole bunch of ways that we can run our file. All right, this is the framework, we're done. We, we are done with like making sure that this is fun to use for the next hour, <laughs> uh, next 40-ish minutes. <laughs> All right, so. We've done our foldering, that's done. We've done a window setup. So let's like start building this. Um, so inside our virtual pet folder, please ignore our backup. <laughs> We're gonna make ourselves a new file. This is called, gonna be called sprite.py. I'm going to make it sprites, same thing as before. If you name it something else, just keep that in mind as you go forward. It's over here. Too many context menus in this Sprites? Okay. Uh, so we've got a sprites.py. We're going to import ppb uh, class het, ppb.base sprite. Uh, if you want to go and create a little pet image uh, in Pisco, go ahead and go do that now. Um, if you do that, go ahead and give it an image line, uh, but I am going to just pass for now. So, it should only be three lines. Uh, we are going to do another step as well. Uh, we're going to go back to create another package, or another module, 
called scenes. And this is mostly just to keep different things away from each other so that we can reason about it later. All right, um, again, import PPP. You're gonna need this in almost every file. Um, class is game. We're gonna just do game because it's another one scene game that we're doing here. Uh, PPP.base scene, def init, except all args and all quarks. Super init. So this is what I was talking about earlier about we can just extend the existing init function to do our thing. Uh, so self dot add. we go on to make actually implementing this uh, into the screen. Uh, we did well just your pop-up there. Oh, I'm sorry. Line, though, <laughs> I can just tell my picture, it's okay. Um, all right. So for those who are done and comfortable, if you go back to your main file, you're going to import game from scenes. Uh, and pass that to the ppp.run as the uh, starting scene. I will leave this up for a little bit. just did in a previous game. Uh, this is a thing that I do in every game I build, I do them in these exact steps. I will uh, pbb.run to make sure a window works. I will add whatever my initial sprite is to make sure that I can get something on screen. And then I will start designing the rest of the game. Uh, it is just a methodology that I use. I think it's really helpful in game design to work on very small things that you can immediately see. Uh, and so that's why we're doing this in the steps we're doing it, uh, even though they are basically the exact same steps we did a little while ago. Is everybody done with this one? Is there anyone still working on this? I should. Okay. I don't see anyone else working. Uh, so now we're going to go back to our main. I already discussed how we're going to do this. Uh, from virtual pet dot scenes import game uh, and in our run function we do starting scene equals game. Uh, we do not have to instantiate this here. Um, I think it's optional, but it's better to just hand it to it because uh, other keyword arguments come from the engine uh, that might be helpful in the future. Um, you really need to document that part because there is a lot of stuff. Um, but here you go. Uh, and now, if we do virtual pet down here, we should have a square in the middle of the screen. Does everybody have, or is there anybody who does not have the starting scene passed into DPV run here? Okay, so it's fine. I don't want to move on and couch you, that's why I. So for those who are caught up right now, 
Um, if you're planning to make art while we're here, uh, we're going to need the pet, we're going to need a piece of food, and we're need, going to need a logo for a food button. So if you want to work on those three things, and again, work quickly, uh, it doesn't have to be great, you can do better later. Anyone still working on this section? Okay. Are you ready to move on? Okay. Just I wanted to make sure. <laughs> All right. So our next thing, we are going to do something. Uh, this is one of the advanced features of PPP we're about to work on. Uh, we're going to do it this way. Primarily because there's so many moving parts in a virtual pet game uh, between the controls and the animations and everything else. Uh, keeping uh, statistics on the object is going to make building this much more hard, difficult. So we're actually going to add a subsystem to the engine to handle our stats. Uh, so to do that, uh, we are going to keep our subsystem in a new file. Uh, we're just going to call it systems.hide. So we need a new class. Uh, I like calling this one pet stats. Uh, this is basically where all of the actual statistics of what we're about to do are going to live. Uh, and from here we need pbb.systems.system. Um, We want. Uh, in doing this, we're going to have a age counter, which defaults to zero. Um, age step. Uh, so we want to pick a value. Uh, basically, how fast do we want to go one tenth of an age? Um, and so that'll be in seconds. Uh, because we're doing this in an environment where we want to be iterating quickly, we want to see this happening. Uh, so I'm going to actually encourage uh, 0 0.5 or 0 0.5 are great for this because you need to see it move very quickly. Um, we, we do not need to define a init file yet because we're not doing anything particularly interesting. Um, but in this place, we will want to do yeah, on idle. So I said this is an advanced feature. Uh, so the idle event is like the update event, except for the fact that the only things that should be responding to an idle event are subsystems. This is actually how the subsystems and the engine interact with each other, um, which is why we're doing it here. Other than that, it is very much like an update. It has uh, the current scene on it, and it has uh, a time delta. Uh, unlike our update function that will always be 15 milliseconds, uh, our idle function is however long it's been since the last idle. Um, so we don't have the same guarantees of consistency with the idle function, uh, which is why, again, advanced feature. But we're going to keep doing this. And so what we're going to do is self dot h counter plus equals event dot time delta and then if self dot h counter is greater than or equal oh I forgot an extremely important piece. We actually want our age at some point, um, so let's throw that on there. Uh, if h counter is greater than or equal to self dot h step We want to self.age plus equals 0 0.1 dot age step or age counter minus equal self.age step. 
And then, mostly because we want to debug, uh, what I'm going to do is def on render. So primarily I'm doing this on render because render happens about 30 times a second versus the hundreds of times a second the idle event's going to happen. Um, and we mostly just want our output to be at least somewhat manageable. 30 a second is still not really manageable, but we'll deal with it. <laughs> uh, and so we're going to do print self.h. All right. So this is built. This will do something. Uh, but like everything else in PPB, we actually have to hook it into the input. Uh, I'm not going to move from this window for a second. Uh, who is still working on this? OK, good. Um, basically, the next step is there is a, um, a systems attribute that you can put on the run function or the engine as an alternative. Um, if you do that, you can provide new systems to the engine. Uh, there is also another one that you can actually pull out the renderer and change it. I am not going to demo that. You can go do that on your own. Uh, but yes, if you decide you don't like our renderer, you can make your own. Um, <laughs> Or our event system, yeah, whatever. Have fun. Um, all right, who's still working? Anybody? No. Okay. All right, so we come back to main, and we do systems equals a list. Oh wait, that must have gotten merged after the release. Okay, so we're going to change this up. The problem with giving a tutorial about a thing that released about a month ago and continuing to do work on it is sometimes you confuse where features exist. Uh, so what we're going to do is with pp.gameengine, uh, the first argument is our game scene uh, and systems equals our list uh, from virtualpet.systems import our pet stats. We just provide this here as GE, GE dot run. Um, we do, we allow a lot of customization with the run function, uh, but at some point you're going to have to hit this thing. Uh, this is actually what run does under the hood. Uh, so this is the same exact function. Uh, we just need more variable more parameters that are than are available in the current run function. Uh, so that's why we do this. Uh, so if you're at this point and you've got all this, you should be able to just do our virtual pet console commands. And as you can see, age is going up in the corner um, very quickly because it's very small. Uh, so from here, uh, the next thing we're going to do is actually make the pet grow. Um, and so to do that, so we talked about using new events. Uh, so we're going to do that here. Uh, so we need a, an events file. So in events, uh, we just need to do from data classes, import data class. Uh, and our first one, data class, This is nice and simple, right? <laughs> All right, so basically the only thing we actually need with our grows older event is to like the age that the stat reached um, so that things that care about how old the pet is can actually function. All right? Uh, everybody got this one? This one second. Oh, yeah, okay. like 25 minutes, so I'm trying to get you through the, the getting the button working. Okay. Um, we may skip uh, how to save this file, but you can dump, you, you, you convert the stats to a dictionary and dump it to JSON and you're done. <laughs> so it's a nice, easy thing. Um, all right, so once we have the events, we go back to our system uh, from virtual pet import events. And up here, 
Uh, after we age up, we are going to signal. Uh, grows older. Self dot age. Uh, and at this point, we can uh, we're going to keep our on render function here just for future debugging. Eventually, you're going to delete that because you don't need it anymore. But because we are going to try a bunch of other stats, uh, we might not actually be able to get to all of them, but we'll try. All right. Make the system on our debug, cook the engine, do all that, make the pet grow. All right, we've added our event, we raise the event. Uh, so now we have to go back to our sprites. Uh, so here's our pet. Uh, in events, I didn't finish the, the, the Rose Older class. I don't know why I missed something. There you go. Yeah, it's just an sure. age as a float. Okay. Yep, no problem. I had, I had an error elsewhere when I tried to run it the last time, though. I had a uh, pet stats not defined in my main. So, what the, can you go back to main to make sure I type that? that incorrect? Did you forget to import it from? That's where it was. I had a line correct, but didn't get the import. Okay. That is the most likely result for we can't find this thing that should be inside. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, we go back to our sprite. We're going to add a def on grows older. Um, at this point, you can import the event uh, module here as well, so that you can type it if you need it. Um, but we kind of know what it is, so we just say event signal. Um, and then I'm going to take a really fancy uh, algorithm that I figured out Elsewhere for us? Not that one. This is all the things I would like us to do, but I don't think we're getting back. Um, on grow, right here. This is the one. We need these things. All right. Oh, whoops. All right, give it a moment while I reorganize all of the things. This is another thing that you can play with. Starting size can be whatever you want. Uh, so that log 1p uh, is actually from the math module. So from math, import log 1p. good in my tests. Um, all right, so this is our on grows older. Um, this is a, yeah, it, it's an ugly little piece of code, but it actually makes the growth feel really good, which is why we do it. Um, natural logarithms do cool things like that. Um, all right, I'm going to give a few more seconds. Uh, so now that this is all here, though, um, I'm going to run this to the side so we can see it in action. So there's the code. Uh, so as we watch, it's going to just slowly get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, so, uh, anyone still working on? Okay, just making sure. No. So we'll probably have to sit here and watch this grow really big. <laughs> and those who are, for those who don't actually know the logarithm graph. Uh, basically, it grows faster at the start, and then it slows, gets slower and slower as it gets closer to our max. All that's happening. <laughs> Again, it's more about feeling good. 
Um, that, that's a trick that I want, I hope everyone picks up. A lot of game development is figuring out what algorithm makes it feel good. <laughs> um, it doesn't have to be accurate to any given thing. It's just make it feel good. Um, um, systems that might just want to go check what missed, you know, missed uh, something there that got an error. Okay. Uh, so the most likely change since our last thing is um, we added the signal event stock grows older and imported the events uh, month. Okay. If it was working on the last step, that's going to be the two things you have to worry about. There you go. Awesome. All right. Is there anyone still working? Okay. I'm going to take that as a no, and we're going to move on. All right. All right. All right, so we have made the pet grow. We're done with steps five. Uh, now we're going to add hunger. Um, this one is basically exactly the same, um, except instead of age counter, age step, and age, uh, we're actually going to do hunger. Uh, so we need uh, a hunger counter, which starts at zero. Uh, our hunger step, which we are going to make. Uh, I have actually found uh, for development, hunger two is pretty good for the numbers that I'm going to use. Again, feel free to play with these. These are like where we modify how the game feels. Uh, and our hunger value, which is going to start at 10. Uh, I'm starting at 10. You can start it at 100 or whatever you'd like. Um, 10 is just, again, this is the fast feedback loops, and then you can play with your numbers after it's working. And then, unsurprisingly, the next thing we want to do is uh, self.hunger counter plus equals event.dime delta with the same basic flow. Just don't do what I keep trying to do and uh, duplicate the uh, age ones. You really do want this to be hunger. Uh, so hunger is actually going to be whole numbers, just because I find that easier. Um, which is also why I gave it a much larger time step than I did for age. Same time, same as before, just so that we know that it works. Let's uh, print out hunger. Actually, you know what we should do here, since now it's just two numbers. Uh, let's do it this way. F strings are awesome. <laughs> numbers without uh, labels in your terminal are probably the worst kind of debugging. <laughs> Alright. Any questions while we're here? summary of changes so that uh, everyone knows what they should be focusing on on the screen. Uh, we added our three class attributes, hunger counter, hunger step, hunger. Uh, we basically duplicated our age block with hunger in the on idle um, with the difference that it is minus equals one instead of plus equals 0 0.1 for our stat. Um, and then on render, we're just going to turn them into you don't have to do this, but it is actually better for your life if you put the labels on. Um, you will thank yourself later if you do it correctly. All right. Is everybody? Is there anybody still working on this? So I 
I'm going to rerun our game. So as you can see, down in the corner, uh, we now have a hunger stat that keeps going down. Um, so one of the things that I'm going to let you know is a bug and you will probably want to fix later. Hunger can go below zero. Uh, you're going to want to figure out how to solve that. Um, and when we get to the point of we're actually increasing hunger, I'm not actually going to show us how to like limit that to a ceiling. I'm going to leave that up to you to figure out how you want to handle an overfed pet. Uh, all right, so we have our new system. Uh, it does the thing. Uh, we now also need to communicate our hunger to other um, other things. So let's uh, okay. same thing as before. Let's go into events. Um, another data class. Remember I said before, hunger is an int this time. So basically copy your grows older, make it grows hungry, and use an int instead of a float. Uh, so I'm going to go back to systems. If we need to come back to the input moment, uh, let me know. Uh, but like I said, you can totally just copy the previous <coughs> one and make the two changes. Uh, so now we go back to systems. Same type thing as before. We want to signal events dot grows hungry. Uh, self dot hunger. All right. So now the stat system is telling everything else that the pet is getting hungrier. That's awesome. Uh, so this is actually where we're going to start doing UI stuff. Uh, instead of just changing one sprite, we're actually going to need to integrate a couple of things together. Uh, uh, so we want to go over to that is the wrong sprites. It's the problem with having the same uh, program twice in the folder. Uh, all right, so in here, we're going to do a def on grows hungry self event signal. Um, so what I'm going to suggest that we do, instead of having this change our pet sprite in some way, we actually want to add a new sprite. Um, and I can tell you what that's going to be called. Uh, so it is going to be... event.scene. Now, we did not define scene in our data classes, but again, the engine is still going to give it to us. Um, Event.scene.add, and we're going to call it a thought. Um, here's our thought. Um, its position should equal self.top.right. Um, I'm going to do top dot right because uh, when I built this, I built it with a fish, and my fish was facing right, so I wanted it from the front of its face. Um, this position can be the position of the thing. Uh, you can do top left, you can do top center. Um, in general, we're going to have it float up, though. Um, so probably the top of the sprite, just pick one of those three positions. Um, but clearly, this is not going to work, so let's go to the next step. Class thought. It's a sprite. Um, def on update. Self dot position. Oh. Yeah, this will crash in very interesting ways. Event uh, dot time delta. Again, you can type in this again. It's the update event um, if you need that. Otherwise, I'm going to just move forward as it is. Uh, plus. Plus equals event dot time delta times vector. Uh, we're just going to move up. Uh, I think three worked, uh, as I remember. Again, this is another. This is just UI, so you can pick. Um, we also need a counter. Zero. Equals. Uh, so we're going to let this stay on screen for three seconds, and if it disappears off screen, that's fine. Uh, so self.counter plus equals event.timedelta. If self.counter 
is greater than or equal to self dot lifetime event dot scene dot remove self. Okay. So the nice thing is we write all this code to make this happen uh, because the pet is actually the thing that makes this happen. We don't actually have to modify our base scene to make any of this happen. Uh, so that's cool. We hit virtual path. Uh, so our thoughts are really big right now. Um, you might want to change that size to something more reasonable, uh, but we're going to leave it for now. Um, I have shown you how to change size many times. Have some fun. All right. So thoughts work. Is everyone done with this? So I'm going to note that the current way that we display our thought, um, every time hunger goes down, um, we're going to do that. If you think that it should only do thoughts when it goes down and it's under a certain value, you'll want a little bit else to check that the age of the event, or the hunger of the event is low enough to display it. Um, but there's only one place to do that, because it's right there in gross hunger. Uh, which is great. It's awesome. Um, what's up? Mistake. Oh, okay. Any questions about what we just did? Like at this point, we've basically done everything we did before. We just have an, an external system telling us when to do it. All right. Uh, I'm going to move on. Does anyone need this code anymore? with how much control we want over speed and stuff, because this is just a UI element. There's not going to be any interaction with it. Uh, so ppv.vector uh, 0, do like negative 3, uh, times event.time delta, and then pet equals next, event.scene.get time equals there's not a get one, and so what we're doing here is actually 
getting that same iterator we would normally grab, uh, but we're just calling next because there's only one thing in it. It should get returned. Uh, if it doesn't, this is an error, and that's a thing we actually want to happen quickly so that we can fix it. Uh, and then uh, if you remember the, uh, the collision detection algorithm, we're going to put that in right here. So if to me like it's actually generating many of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so how what how low is your uh, your hunger step? Yes, I'm sure it was that service. That's going to be in uh, hunger steps where in events? Uh, it's in systems. Systems. Hunger step two. That would be what has a hunger step two people sometimes. Yeah, that's what she had. Thought so. Give me a second to increase my font size. Ah, there we go. Is that a little easier to read? Yeah. All right, so if we go back to systems, um, decrement your counter, it will continue firing every frame, or actually it's it's faster than every frame, yeah. which is why you yeah, got why it looks strange, but basically we'll come back to sprites and I can finish up on them. Mm -hmm. Pet equals line. Pet equals, oh, yep, yeah. okay. All right, so we're on food again. Uh, so this is going to be our collision detection algorithm. I'm just putting it together slightly differently so that I can remember what I'm doing. Uh, pet dot. Position minus self dot position. And this is self dot size plus pet dot size. Actually, this makes my 80 character line lengths uh, kind of long. Uh, all right, and at this point, we would do event dot scene dot remove um, self. Uh, and then we're actually going to need to single signal a new event type. Um, how are we on time? We're 5.15. Yeah, I think we might be That's, at time. Yeah, okay. roughly. So I'm going to do very quickly, uh, basically the pattern we're doing here is actually the same way you're going to add a button. Uh, your button's just going to be another class that you put in the corner and when you click on, on a mouse pressed, or on a button pressed event, uh, you actually create the food class. Uh, but in this case, we would, so we've got this. We go over to our events. Uh, basically, I would do a uh, div class, um, class pet eats. Uh, and we can just pass on that one. Uh, because this is basically just saying that, oh, the food was eaten by the pet. So the food hit the pet. Uh, very quick, um, we come back over here, and in here we do a def on, what did I call it? Pet eats, on pet eats, event signal. Uh, so this just meant it was fed, so you can do self.hunger plus equals some value. Um, I find three or four with all of the settings I just gave you works the best. Um, all right, so that's basically how you get things to interact, is you make the UI element that makes it do something, uh, throw an event, and then capture it in the stats system so that you can turn around and like actually modify your stats. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time, so I can't show you the other bits. Um, come find me. Um, the business card that was in your seat 
has my email on it, uh, and also our website and all the pip install stuff, you are welcome to come talk to us. And in fact, I'm going to do one more thing. Those of you who have Discord, um, we have a Discord channel. Discord crashed at some point. <laughs> So if you look up here, uh, there's the link right there. Um, I will leave it up for a couple of minutes so anyone who has Discord and is wanting to do this can write it down. Um, and this will let you in. Uh, you'll have to do it sometime in the next 24 hours because I did not create an infinite invite here. But, all right, any questions? Um, otherwise, we will go out there and you can come find me for the next hour or so. <laughs> all right? Thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry that we didn't get all the way through that second one. Uh, it was more complicated than I thought. <laughs>